All right, so I am recording. Hopefully, um, hopefully, um, this uh, I've got my heater on behind me because it's a little cold down here in the basement, and hopefully that's um, it's not so loud that it's causing a problem. If it is, please let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to assume everything is good. Um, good, you don't hear it. Right, great. That's exactly what I wanted. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Let me share my screen. And we'll jump in with two feet. All righty. So good morning, everyone. My apologies. Give me just one second. Uh, I, I was in office hours on my other computer rather than this session. And I like to have my other computer in the session so I can see what my students are seeing. Okay, cool. All righty. So um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do over the next few days. So the digestive system. Um, we're going to be covering the digestive system. And the digestive system, I actually have it completely online. Usually I teach it in a flip format where students will watch the videos at home and then they would come to class and we have learning activities and hands-on activities that we, we would do in class. Um, obviously we can't do that because we're online. So um, I'm going to cover the first two lectures today, which is overview of the digestive system and the oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. Uh, it's about 35 minutes of material. Then over the weekend, I am asking for you to look at the screencast on the stomach and the screencast on the, the anatomy of the small intestine. And then on Monday, I'll cover the digestive physiology of the small intestine. I'll actually email you a little learning activity that you could complete or at least start. Um, and then we'll go over it in class. And then if I have time, I'll cover the large intestine. If I don't have time, then you'll cover that outside of class on your own. There's not a whole lot that happens in the large intestine. The large intestine is basically just a big dryer that reclaims water that's in your digestive tract um, before excretion so you, that, that um, you don't dehydrate. Okay, so it's pretty uh, pretty self-explanatory. But the digestive physiology of the small intestine is very important. And I want to make sure that I have adequate time to really go through that and give you uh, opportunity to ask questions. So that's going to be the game plan on the digestive system. Also, before we actually get into today's content, I want to remind you that your third exam is currently online and it will close tonight at midnight. For those of you who've already taken that exam, it's about 15 of you, there was one question where I, uh, in the question I said, see image below. And I realized this morning that there was no image below for you to see. Uh, it, that image was not 100% required. In fact, for several years, I had that question on exams without an image and I added the image later. Um, however, uh, once I realized that that image was not there, I did add it. Um, and so students who haven't taken the exam will have the benefit of that image. And those of you who had already taken it didn't have the benefit. So those of you who missed that question, I gave you half credit, right? I, I see that as sort of equalizing things, okay? But it's it's only one point. But so so if you missed that question, um, I did go back and give you one, one point for it, even though you missed it because you didn't have the image there and people who are who take it from here on out are going to have that image. Not that I'm convinced it's really going to help them all that much, but that is um, the situation. Also, just want to remind you that your pre-lab on um, the functional anatomy of the digestive system is due tonight at midnight if you haven't completed that. And also your um, lab quiz covering anatomy of the heart and anatomy of blood vessels is due tonight at midnight also. Hopefully you didn't wait to the last minute to do all of that uh, today, but all of those deadlines do hit tonight at midnight. 
Okay, let's talk about the digestive system. Um, I really enjoy talking about the digestive system. Um, I think students are probably, of all the organ systems, the digestive system, uh, probably the, the organ system that you're most familiar with. Uh, my guess is that a lot of ailments that you've had over the years uh, have involved the digestive system. Some of those ailments you probably brought upon yourself, <laughs> and in, in other situations they, they probably uh, you know just just happened uh, through no fault of your own. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that you have witnessed or experienced, but you probably didn't understand exactly what was happening. Uh, and I, I, I think that students feel en enlightened and they can connect very well with the digestive system because, you know, everyone's familiar with, you know, what happens in your oral cavity and when swallowing and chewing and you can feel things happening inside your digestive tract, although you may not exactly know what's happening. I think by uh, covering this topic in this class, it shed some lights on on some things that you've experienced uh, um, in the past. So anyway, we're going to start with overview of the digestive system, and if I can get this to go forward. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover in this screencast. We're going to define a nutrient, describe the function of the digestive system, briefly describe the five essential act activities that the digestive system performs. We're going to describe the basic anatomy of the digestive system, and this is going to be overlap with what you're covering in lab right now. We're going to describe the structure and function of the layers of the digestive tract, and we're going to describe the peritoneum. And then lastly, we're going to contrast peristalsis with segmentation. If you recall from the very beginning of the semester, chapter one, we talked about survival needs. Those are substances or conditions that the body um, needs in order to survive, in order uh, for life to exist. And one of those were nutrients. Before we move, move any further, let's review or define what a nutrient is. So a nutrient is a molecule that is used by the body for metabolism. It can be used for growth where you're growing by increasing the cell number or cell size. It can be used for maintenance, replacing cells that have died. And it can be used for repair of cells that were destroyed due to injury. And all of these processes require energy. And nutrients, most nutrients are used as a source of energy. But a small portion actually are incorporated into your tissues. So let's talk about the different types of nutrients. We have the carbohydrates, of course. Carbohydrates are your starches and your sugars. Proteins. Proteins are composed of amino acids. And if you recall, proteins make up over 50% of the dry matter of your body. Lipids. This includes the triglycerides, which make up the, you know, your, um, your adipose tissue also includes steroids, as well as the phospholipids that make up the uh, plasma membranes of your cells. Vitamins, which are uh, critical to uh, metabolism, and minerals, such as calcium and phosphorus and iodine, etc. All of those are nutrients which the body requires in order to function. Oh, and of course, water. Water is also a nutrient. It is the most, and also the most abundant substance in the human body. It participates in chemical reactions, and it is also the medium in which metabolism or chemical reactions occur. It is the function of the digestive system to allow the human body to acquire these nutrients. 
So where do we get these nutrients from? Well, we get them from other animals. Other animals, excuse me, other organisms. So that'd be animals and plants. Other organisms require the same nutrients that we do. So how do we get these nutrients from them? Well, we kill them. We kill them. We add spices and things to them, and we prepare, prepare their bodies uh, uh, in a way that's palatable to us. And we turn them into food, and then we consume that food. And it is the function of the digestive system to bring that food into the digestive tract, to break that food down, and then to absorb those nutrients into our, um, into our um, blood and lymphatic system. To do this, the digestive system engages in five different activities. Okay. Are you, uh, let me ask you a question. Are you able to see the slide that says the digestive system essential activities? No, we can't see it. Okay. Which, what are you, you're seeing the digestive system where it says other organisms? Yeah, so I've advanced to the next slide and it has not. I don't know what's up with that. Huh. Okay. Let me stop sharing and then I'll start sharing again and then maybe that'll take care of it. I noticed on my um, student view that it was stuck at the previous slide and that's why I stopped and asked. All right. Let's try. Okay. All right. Hopefully that, that takes care of that. All righty. So there are um, five essential activities that the digestive system in, um, performs in order to um, provide the body with nutrients. First is ingestion. Ingestion is simply the taking or bringing of food into the GI tract. Second is propulsion, moving that food through different parts of the digestive system. So different parts of the digestive system have different specific functions that it has to perform. And so uh, that food has to be moved through the digestive system to the different organs, um, like, an, like an assembly line, but sort of like the opposite. Instead of building something, you're breaking something down. Um, digestion. Digestion is the breaking down of food. It can be mechanical, where it's simply, um, the, which is the physical or mechanical breakdown, and then there's chemical digestion, which is where um, there are actual uh, chemical reactions that are occurring where bonds are being broken. The whole purpose of digestion is to break the food down into molecules that are small enough to then be transported into the body, either into the blood or into the lymph system. And that process is called absorption. And then finally, whatever substances that can't be digested and absorbed have to be eliminated. And so the fifth and final activity that the digestive system performs is defecation. That's just elimination of indigestible residue or fiber from the GI tract. So those are the five essential functions that the digestive system performs. Now let's look at the anatomy, sort of an overview, I should say, of the anatomy of the digestive system. So the digestive system consists of the alimentary canal, uh, and I don't like the term gastrointestinal tract, because really the gastrointestinal tract is only your, your, uh, your stomach and your intestines. A better term would be the alimentary canal. Well, the alimentary canal is basically that tube that runs that runs from your mouth to your anus, or as I like to say, from rooter to tutor. Then you have accessory organs which play a role in 
uh, digestion, but they're technically not a part of the digestive tract, like the salivary glands and the teeth and tongue, etc. In the mouth or oral cavity, I should say, you have the accessory organs. Um, oops, sorry. You have the accessory organs, the salivary glands, the teeth and the tongue, and then when you get to the small intestine, the accessory organs are the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Again, they're not technically part of the GI tract, but they play very important roles in digestion, thus the term accessory organs. Okay, let's now look at the four basic layers of the GI tract. And, you know, although this gets a little heavy on anatomy, um, the focus in lecture will be physiology. So there'll, there'll be a lot of overlap here, what I talk about with lab. So the wall of your small intestine, which is what we're looking at here, consists of four basic layers, and we're going to discuss them going from lumen to um, the outer layer. And so the lumen, of course, is the hollow portion of the small intestine. This is where the quarter pound of cheese would be moving through. And then what lines the lumen is the mucosa. Deep to the mucosa is the submucosa, shown here in white. That's where a lot of your glands are, are found. And then if we continue to move away from the lumen, we have our muscularis externa, which is composed of uh, smooth muscles and the nerves that control them. And then our outermost layer is the serosa, specifically the visceral peritoneum. So those are the four basic layers of the digestive tract, although specifically here we're looking at the small intestine. That would be true of most of the digestive tract in general. Let's look more closely at each of these layers, starting with the mucosa. So again, we're going to start at the lumen and work our way out. All right. So the mucosa, which is shown here, is the layer that is in contact with the food that you consume. The tissue that lines the lumen is a mucous membrane. So it, it's an epithelial membrane so that you have your, your layer of epithelial cells supported by a deeper layer of uh, areolar connective tissue. The epithelial tissue in the mouth and the pharynx, which is your throat, and esophagus is um, stratified squamous, also in your anus, a stratified squamous. Its function is protection. It's the same type of tissue that you have in your skin. However, when you get to the stomach and, and the small and large intestine, that epithelial tissue changes to simple columnar because there the function becomes absorption. Also throughout the entire digestive tract, you have goblet cells. Goblet cells, if you remember, produce mucus. Well, why do you need mucus? Well, you need mucus to lubricate the digestive tract for ease of movement of food through the digestive tract. And then in some parts of the, of the digestive tract, such as the stomach, you need protection against the uh, substances that are being produced and secreted into the digestive tract. Because what can break down the food that you consume uh, can also break down the uh, the um, lining of the GI tract itself. Supporting those epithelial cells are a layer, a deeper layer of areolar tissue, also referred to as lamina propria. And there's also a small layer of smooth muscles to help uh, with um, movement of substances uh, as they come into contact with the layer of epithelial tissue. The mucosa also is the first line of defense against microorganisms. They also, there's also the release of digestive enzymes by the mucosa. Uh, and this is also where absorption of nutrients occurs. Now we're going to move from the mucosa to the submucosa, which is shown here in white. 
The submucosa consists of connective tissue. This is where the uh, blood capillaries and the lacteals or lymphatic capillaries are found, which are going to absorb nutrients, transport it from cells that line the mucosa. You've got lots of glands producing secretions. Uh, you also have a lot of nervous tissue to control the GI tract found in the submucosa. Continuing from the lumen toward the surface of the um, <clears throat> gastrointestinal tract, we have the muscularis externa. Okay. The muscularis externa consists of two layers of smooth muscle and nerves that control them. So the inner layer of smooth muscle is circular. It actually sort of wraps around in a circular pattern around the lumen. It's going to be responsible for a process of movement called segmentation. It's sort of the squeezing of this tube, and it helps to uh, mix the food with digestive enzymes. And then superficial two layer of smooth muscle is an outer longitudinal layer. These muscles run the length of uh, the GI tract, and they're responsible for a different type of movement called peristalsis. Peristalsis is sort of the rhythmic movement across the length of the digestive tract, which is responsible for moving the uh, contents of the digestive tract from one location to the next. And we'll talk about those uh, later, those two processes in just a few minutes. Also found in some parts of the digestive tract are skeletal muscles. In your mouth and your pharynx and your anus, there are skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles, of course, are under voluntary control. And of course, we have a certain amount of voluntary control of the movement of our mouths, our pharynx, and our anus because of the uh, presence of skeletal muscles. We really can't control the remainder of our digestive tract uh, or the movement of our di digestive tract because smooth muscles control that movement and smooth muscles are not under voluntary control. And of course, controlling all of this is a network of nerves. Uh, in fact, um, although it's beyond the scope of this class, the digestive system uh, is considered to have its own um, nervous system, believe it or not, that is um, um, connected to the central nervous system. And so we can influence it, but it is uh, considered to be, uh, to be a nervous system unto itself. And the outermost layer, of course, is the serosa. If you remember, the serous membranes line the, in, uh, line the entire ventral body cavity, and they consist of two layers. The layer that is in contact with the organs of the ventral body cavity is called the visceral layer, and we specifically call the serous membranes that line the abdominal cavity, the peritoneal membranes. And so we, hear, we have here the visceral peritoneum. We have a layer of simple squamous epithelial cells supported by a deeper layer of areolar tissue. Its function is to protect the deeper tissues of the GI tract. And as I mentioned, it's also called the visceral peritoneum. Notice that the visceral peritoneum has these extensions called mesentery. And what mesentery do is they attach these organs of our abdominal cavity to the walls of the abdominal cavity. Right? So here's the, mes here's the mesentery here extending away from the organ, and it would attach it to the walls of the GI tract. Now, I just want to take a moment to sort of review what a serous membrane is, just to make sure we're, we're all on the same page here and this is clear. So, so we're looking at the, the thoracic cavity and, of course, the 
uh, your uh, most of your GI tract is, of course, in the abdominal cavity. But serous membranes have two layers. You have an outer layer, which is called the parietal layer, and then you have the inner layer that's actually touching the organs, the visceral layer. It's composed of an outer layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue, and then you have a deeper layer of areolar tissue to support it, as is the case with all uh, epithelial membranes. If you recall, you can sort of visualize um, a serous membrane and its relationship to, to the organs that they surround. If you were to so take a, a partially inflated balloon and then took your fist and pushed into that balloon such that when one side of the balloon, the side touching your fist came into close contact but not touching the other layer, you would have like two layers here, right? And the, the layer touching your fist so your fist would be like the organ, and the layer that was the side of the balloon that was touching your fist would be like the parietal layer, and then the other other um, side of the balloon would be like the the uh, the serous. I'm sorry, the pari the parietal layer. All right, so this would be the visceral layer, and this would be the parietal layer. And let me just put that into some context. So this is a sagittal section of um, a human. And you can see, like here we have our, our various organs. Here's the liver, the stomach, large intestine, various other parts of the small and large intestine. <clears throat> and collectively, it's called the, perit the peritoneal membranes. You have the visceral peritoneum, which is shown here in black that's attached to the organs and then lining the abdominal cavity is the parietal peritoneum and then you have a space between which is called the peritoneal cavity i have a better view of that on the next slide right <clears throat> well excuse me in a couple of slides but this is the visceral peritoneum here which is attached directly to the uh <clears throat> to the organ and then here's the mesentery coming, which is a basically extension of the visceral peritoneum. And that visceral peritoneum, as I said, as the mesentery will attach the organ to the abdominal wall. Okay. And then you have the parietal peritoneum that lines the abdominal cavity. Now let me, okay, yes. Now here is the slide that I, I referenced just a few minutes ago. All right. So again, here we're looking at a sagittal section of the abdominal cavity. The visceral peritoneum is that layer of membrane that is attached directly to the outer surface of the organs. And it's shown here in blue, right? So you can see it here in blue. Right? All of the, the entire digestive tract is covered with this visceral peritoneum. The parietal peritoneum, shown here in red, lines the entire abdominal body cavity. Okay. <clears throat> and also notice that you've got extensions of the visceral peritoneum, which we call the mesentery, that attach the organs to the wall of the abdominal cavity. So your your the organs of your abdominal cavity aren't just like sitting stacked on top of one another. They're suspended to the wall of the abdominal cavity. And the space between the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum is called the peritoneal cavity. Okay. It's not. I don't ask a lot of questions, but well, probably not any questions about this. Uh, but I, I wanted you to have an understanding of, you know, what's the visceral peritoneum, what's the parietal peritoneum, and uh, what the peritoneal cavity is, because they talk about this in the book, but um, I, I don't think they do a very good job of really allowing you to have a sort of a visual image in your head about um, what it actually looks like. Uh, one thing I will note, to notice that uh, the pancreas and the duodenum are actually behind the peritoneum. There's what's called retroperitoneum. 
Okay, so I want to talk about the two types of movements that occur in the digestive tract. One is called peristalsis, and the other is called segmentation. Peristalsis, which is shown here, is responsible for the movement of food through the digestive tract. So what you're looking at is food moving through the digestive tract, going from left to right at different times, right? It's like, like this, are the, this is the earliest time, and then after, after some time passes, here it is here at this location, here it is at this location. What happens is behind the food, you have contraction of some muscles, and then in front of it, you have relaxation of smooth muscles. And so you get this rhythmic contraction that moves the food from point A to point B to point C. That is how food moves through our digestive tract, away from the mouth and toward the anus. And that process is called peristalsis. And primarily, the smooth muscles that are responsible for that are the longitudinal smooth muscles. The other type of shown in red. And so over time, everything gets mixed together and you have efficient um, uh, digestion of the substances in the digestive tract. Again, with segmentation, the purpose is to, uh, to mix. Yeah, I saw it disappeared, but it, but it did come back. So we're good. <laughs> okay. So to review, our learning objectives were define a nutrient, describe the function of the digestive system, briefly describe the five essential activities of the digestive system, describe the basic anatomy of the digestive system, describe the structure and function of the layers of the digestive, I'm sorry, of the gastrointestinal tract, describe the peritoneum, and contrast peristalsis and segmentation. Before I leave this uh, topic, I did want to try to illustrate <clears throat> peristalsis versus segmentation. So I'm holding a tube of toothpaste, okay? Everyone's familiar with a tube of toothpaste. Um, <clears throat> of course, when you brush your teeth, you, you have to, um, you have to um, <clears throat> move toothpaste out of the tube. And so you typically would like start at one end and sort of, sort of milk it, right, to get the toothpaste to come out of the the opening, right? Well, that would be like peristalsis. Uh, the, the longitudinal muscles would be rhythmically moving that toothpaste from here to there. That's peristalsis. That's what moves substances through the digestive tract. Segmentation, on the other hand, let's say for whatever reason, I, I wasn't interested in moving the toothpaste out, but um, I wanted to mix the contents of this tube. Well, then I might do something like this, right? Where I'm squeezing different parts and mixing the contents, right? That's segmentation. Segmentation serves to mix the contents of the GI tract. It doesn't really do much for moving substances along the GI tract. So if you had questions about that, hopefully uh, that is clear. Before we move on to the next screencast, are there any questions? Okay. Although I spent some time talking about anatomy, anatomy is what we focus on in, la in lab. Okay? The focus in lecture will always be physiology uh, and function. Okay, so <clears throat> if there are no questions, let's move on to the next screencast.
And that screen cast is the oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. Okay, so our learning objectives are as follows. We're going to list the accessory organs of the oral cavity, list the components of saliva, and describe their functions, summarize the events of digestion that occur in the oral cavity, and describe completely the process of deglutition, which is swallowing, describe GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, so um, in our study of the digestive system. We're basically going to follow the path of food. We're going to start <clears throat> we're going to start in the oral cavity and then that food's going to move down the esophagus into the stomach, then from the stomach to the small intestine, then from the small intestine to the large in intestine and then out through defecation. We're basically, that's the order in which we're going to cover the digestive system. So with this screencast, we're, um, we're going to start with the oral cavity, then move to the esophagus, and then um, through swallowing, move into the stomach. And then this weekend, you're going to complete the screencast on the stomach and the uh, anatomy of the small intestine. And then on Monday, we'll cover the physiology of uh, digestion in the small intestine and the large intestine, just basically following the pathway of food. Okay, let's start with the oral cavity. And then technically, your mouth is the opening to the oral cavity, and then what's inside that um, that space inside is technically the oral cavity. Although uh, in practice, we sort of use mouth and oral cavity um, synonymously. The function of the oral cavity is first ingestion. That's bringing substances into the digestive tract. Then it's digestion, mechanical and chemical digestion. The whole function of the oral cavity is to form the food that you ingest into a bolus for ease of swallowing. And a bolus is nothing more than a wet mass of food that you can swallow and bring into your stomach. But that's pretty much the function of the oral cavity. Bring it in, ingest it, and then form it into a bolus that can be swallowed. The accessory organs of the oral cavity include the salivary glands, your teeth, and of course your tongue. All right, salivary glands. You have three pairs of salivary glands. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because uh, this is covered in lab, but you've got three pairs. You've got the parotid salivary glands, which are anterior and a little inferior to your ears. You've got the submandibular glands, which are below the mandible, thus the term submandibular. And then you've got another pair, which are the sublingual, which are below the tongue. Lingual meaning tongue. The purpose of saliva is to, one, moisten the food and bind it together so that bolus can be formed. Two, control bacteria. No matter how clean you are or how clean your house is, there's bacteria everywhere. And so the saliva also serves to uh, control and destroy bacteria and also to initiate mechanical digestion, breaking the food into smaller bits, and chemical digestion where there's actually some breaking of, of large molecules into smaller molecules. All right, let's look at the components of saliva. Of course, the number one component is gonna be water. Water dilutes the food, helps wash the mouth, help dissolve the food molecules so that the enzymes can then break them down. Believe it or not, the saliva actually contains antibodies. IgA stands for immunoglobulin A. Those are antibodies that will attack certain foreign antigens or foreign bacteria and viruses. Saliva also contains the enzyme lysozyme. Lysozyme breaks down the walls of bacteria. The whole function here of the IgAs and lysozyme is to help control bacteria that may be ingested with food. Also, there is the protein mucin in saliva. Mucin is the protein in mucus. So yes, there's a small amount of mucus, shall we say, in your saliva that helps provide lubrication. And you're going to find that the entire digestive tract um, uh, has goblet cells that secrete 
mucin in order to lubricate the GI tract. And then lastly, the component, the last component of saliva is amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that digests the carbohydrate amylose. Amylose is a digestible starch. This is the only chemical digestion that occurs in the mouth. So amylose is a starch, is a digestible starch, like the starch you would find in like crackers or bread or pastas. Amylase, which is in your saliva, breaks amylose down into maltose. Maltose is a disaccharide. It is a simple sugar. It is sweet to the taste. And that is why when you eat crackers, if you hold that cracker in your mouth for any amount of time, it begins to taste sweeter and sweeter. And that's because the amylase is breaking the amylose, which really doesn't have a whole lot of taste, down into maltose, which is a simple sugar, which uh, you taste as sweet. That is the only chemical digestion that occurs in the mouth. There's no digestion of protein. There's no di digestion of fat, only that amylose. Saliva is continuously released uh, to keep the mouth moist. Large amounts are secreted in the presence of food. Basically, pressure in the mouth causes the release of saliva. That's why if you've you know, whenever you're, you go to the dentist or what have you and they're in your mouth with those tools, right, you keep producing saliva because the stimulus for the secretion of saliva is pressure. And also, of course, this is mediated by your uh, or controlled by your brain stem. So uh, hearing someone talk about food, thinking about food, smelling food, seeing food, all of that emotional stimuli can cause the production of saliva. Let's talk for a moment about your teeth and your tongue. Well, your they play very important roles. Well, your tongue, number one, helps bring food into your mouth, and your, your teeth, your incisors specifically, help you ingest and bring food into your mouth as well. And after it's in there, your uh, molars and premolars help break it down through chewing, a process called mastication, and your tongue helps keep that food between your upper and lower molars and premolars. Uh, if not for your tongue, your food would just sit right here in the, in the middle of your oral cavity and, uh, and, uh, and chewing would be very inefficient. So that tongue helps move that food to the lateral uh, um, parts of your oral cavity so those teeth can uh, grind it down. So let's sort of just review what's happened in the oral cavity. Well, first we've ingested the food, we've mixed it with saliva, we've got some mechanical breakdown of, of, of completed by chewing or mastication, and we've got a little chemical digestion that has occurred in the form of amylose, a digestible starch being broken down by amylase to maltose. And so now the food is moistened and it's organized into this sticky bolus, which now can be swallowed. I want to note that there's no absorption of nutrients in the oral cavity, in general, I should say, right? Can you get a little absorption of, 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 of some substances across the walls of the mucosa? Certainly, and certainly there's some drugs like nitroglycerin that uh, are, uh, are administered through holding them in, in the mouth, uh, and they uh, um, are absorbed through the mucosa. But in terms of nutrients, in general, there's no absorption in the uh, in the oral cavity. All righty, so we formed this bolus in the oral cavity. Now it's time to swallow it or for the process of deglutition to occur. And when we talk about swallowing or deglutition, we're talking about moving that bolus from the oral cavity down the esophagus into the stomach. Uh, and believe it or not, this is a rather complicated process. It's not complicated for you or I because most of it is involuntary. The body just sort of handles it, and we don't think twice about it. But when you, as we 
as we look at how that occurs, you're going to see that there's going to be a lot of players um, that are involved. And, and um, successful swallowing requires coordinated activity of these players, like the tongue, the soft palate, the pharynx, uh, and different parts of the esophagus, and even the larynx, although I don't have it listed here because it's part of the respiratory system. So let's look at this, this process. And this process can be divided into three different phases. The buccal phase, which is the voluntary phase, the pharyngeal phase, which involves the pharynx or throat, and esophageal phase, which involves your, your esophagus. I believe your book sort of combines the pharyngeal and the esophageal into the pharyngoesophageal phase, but it doesn't matter if you split it up into two or three, the same processes occur, and the only voluntary portion is the initial phase, which is the buccal phase. Everything else is autonomic, and the body pretty much does it without any um, um, voluntary control on your part. Okay, we can move forward here with my slides. Let's look at this process. So, deglutition is going to be initiated in the oral cavity. It's going to involve the soft palate and in particular, the uvula of the soft palate of the oral cavity. Now, the soft palate is the muscular, glandular portion of the posterior roof of your mouth, right? This area in here. And in particular, it's where the uvula is found. That's that little dangling bit of soft tissue found in the center of the uh, posterior portion of your oral cavity right? Some people, for whatever reason, have chosen to uh, pierce their uvula, right? And I, I do not know why I personally do this. I have no idea if there are complications that are associated with that, but uh, it's, it's always uh, uh, something to, it's always a, a, a topic of conversation with, with students. But anyway, that's the uvula, soft palate, going to be very much involved in the initial stages of deglutition. So, <clears throat> Let's talk about your pharynx or throat. So I've highlighted it here in blue. It basically extends from the posterior portion of your nasal cavity all the way down to your esophagus. And it consists of three different parts. The nasopharynx is the portion that's posterior to your nasal cavity. We're not really going to worry about that today because it's only part of the respiratory system because it's a because uh, normally only air passes through it. Posterior to the oral cavity is the oropharynx. Now, it's part of both the respiratory and digestive system because it's a common passageway for both food and air, as is the laryngopharynx, which is posterior to the larynx. The larynx would be found right here. And the laryngopharynx basically is connected to the larynx on the anterior side and inferior, the esophagus, right? It's here where air is going to be routed into the trachea through the pharynx, or if it's food, it's going to move into the esophagus. All right, so let's start the process of deglutition, right? So we have, it's going to involve the oral cavity the oral pharynx and the laryngopharynx, which is going to lead to the esophagus, and the esophagus is then going to lead to the stomach. All right, so here's our pathway here. Now, what's going to be very important is that food is that that food is routed into the esophagus and not into the larynx and trachea, because if that were to happen, you literally could choke to death. So when you swallow this epiglottis, this little bill-shaped um, cartilage closes and prevents that from happening, at least usually. Okay, so this is our first phase of deglutition. It's called the buccal or voluntary phase, and it's the only part that you control voluntarily. So you have, you've been chewing this, chewing food, and you have this bolus that you're now ready to swallow. So the first thing you do is you take your tongue and you push that bolus 
to the back of the mouth. And that pretty much is the end of the buckle phase. It's the only part that you voluntary control. Everything that happens after that is involuntary. And so what happens after that? That initiates a series of reflexes. First thing that happens is that uvula moves posterior and superior. So the so the uvula moves posterior and superiorly and it cuts off access of that bolus to the nasal cavity. So we don't want food going up into the nasal cavity. The second thing that happens is the epiglottis closes so that, so that that bolus can't enter the larynx and cause you to choke. And it also causes the upper, upper esophageal sphincter, that muscle at the top of the esophagus, to relax. Uh, and also your tongue cuts off the access to your mouth. So that food, that bolus, only has one place it can go, which is into the esophagus. As soon as that bolus enters the pharynx, that begins the pharyngeal phase. And then peristalsis just moves it into the esophagus. And once it enters the esophagus, that starts the esophageal phase. Got a little ahead of my slides here. I apologize. That starts the esophageal phase, and then peristalsis just brings it all the way down to the opening of the stomach, which is controlled by another sphincter muscle. A sphincter muscle is nothing more than a round muscle. It relaxes this lower esophageal sphincter. It's also called the cardioesophageal sphincter because it controls the movement of that bolus from the esophagus to the cardia of the stomach. It relaxes. And then the bolus enters, and then after, right? So after the bolus enters that e, uh, uh, lower esophageal sphincter, then contracts again and closes. And it's very important that it closes so that you don't get regurgitation of the contents of the stomach back into the esophagus. Okay, so that lower esophageal sphincter immediately contracts to prevent the reflux of stomach acid and other com and, and the other contents of the stomach back into the esophagus. Now, obviously, in some people, the lower esophageal sphincter is weak, or you could describe it as being a leaky, and it does allow the contents of the stomach to reflux back into the lower portion of the esophagus. And when that happens, you feel it as heartburn. Now, if it happens infrequently, because, I mean, who doesn't have heartburn from time to time? It's not that big of a deal. If you have a chronic, uh, chronic acid reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease, that can erode the lining of uh, the esophagus, and it can create some complications, uh, even to the point of actually causing cancer of uh, the esophagus. So if that's something that you you know you get infrequently, not that big of a deal. However, if it's something that uh, occurs um, often, that's something that you you probably should have looked at. Um, it's common to have GERD uh, when one is pregnant. I believe the hormone um, progesterone causes uh, that lower esophageal sphincter to become leaky. That typically resolves after uh, parturition. Uh, the, um, the symptoms, that burning sensation that you get when that occurs is often referred to as heartburn because the heart is right above, is basically in this area. And so it some people describe that feeling as, as feeling like their heart is actually burning. And in fact, some people, my mother included, actually thought she was having a heart attack uh, and went to uh, the hospital just to find that, no, you just had some you know, pretty bad um, um, reflux. And so, as I said, the, this can damage the mucosa and cause pain and inflammation if it's uh, something that you know, occurs infrequently, not that big a deal. Uh, if it is something that is chronic, uh, then that's something that uh, you, you'll need uh, that you should get looked at. Okay. 
some changes might include uh, some lifestyle changes or certain substances that can uh, cause this to happen. Um, and acids, sometimes medications um, and, and other um, actions might be necessary. All right, so uh, just to review, our learning objectives were list the accessory organs of the oral cavity, list the components of saliva and describe their functions, summarize the events of digestion that occur in the oral cavity, describe completely the process of deglutition or swallowing, describe GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, so your next topic, which you'll cover uh, on your own, will be the stomach, followed by anatomy of the small intestine. All right, thank you for your patience. We went over by a few uh, minutes. However, I, I, um, those of you who could stay, thank you very much for staying. Um, if you have any questions at this time, 